in Atlanta. Back in Schwartz, we work with the Service Chief Education Force Tournament and also work on the Defensive Zone. In September 1999, we became an independent policy measure and worked as measure for four years before taking over the Arkansas College of Life in 2004. For those of you who are familiar with the travel box for Arkansas, it is the place in which we travel to almost anywhere, in New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut, any place other than New York. Thanks so much for having me. I feel I've done a full day's job already. So I'm, I'm glad to do more. Um, um, first, I want to thank you know uh, uh, Robert Early, Mona Frederick, uh, Carolyn Dever, uh, Galen. You know, there are lots of places you really didn't want to go to all that often, and there are some places that you really did. And I love coming to Vanderbilt, uh, to, to Nashville. It was one of the best parts of the job. And uh, when I was out here and um, hung out at Robert's Western World, when it was, when it was just beginning, we so the, the BR549 moment, just any of you remember that? And uh, I had a, had a great time. Anyway, in some ways, talking about the media in this election seemed a lot simpler when the idea first came up two months ago. Because as it turned out, I mean, this election has been so extraordinary, so hyperbolic, so overheated, so over the top, so theatrical. Other years. Um, and that's something we can discuss. I mean, I think in the end, yes. But, you know, in some ways, it's, it's sort of like using Michael Jackson's life to talk about black people in America. Or, you know, it's, or it's, you know, describing the weather in New Orleans while in the middle of uh, Katrina. Or describing business as usual in college football with Vanderbilt at 5-1 and one and Michigan at 2-4. and four. But, um, you know, that said, you know, in lots of ways, sort of the, the gaudier the circus, the, the busier the ringmaster. And, you know, I think that's the story of this year. I mean, it's really been an extraordinary election, but it's an extraordinary year for media coverage. So what I'd like to do is sort of start with a, a brief history of campaign reporting over the centuries in American life, um, reflect on two races I covered long ago that in some ways, you know, frame a lot of what's going on now, and then offer, uh, throw out lots of thoughts about uh, how things have gone this year, um, and um, see if there are any questions, thoughts, rants, complaints, whatever. So, and uh, so what, my one caveat is 
Um, my job at the New York, you know, there, I have sort of this hybrid job at the New York Times. So if you're an op-ed columnist, your job is to spew opinions left and right. In fact, if you're a Marine dad, you can even spew them in Latin, <laughs> if you read her column yesterday. Um, and if you're a regular reporter, your, your job is, is um, just to report the news. I write a news page column, which I'm allowed sort of voice and point of view, but um, I can only spew so many opinions. So I'll try to be circumspect. Um, um, and um, so anyway, you know, when you think of, um, uh, of the history of American campaign reporting, it's important to remember for that for really almost the first half of the country's existence, or at least the first century, there weren't really campaigns, or at least there weren't, there weren't candidates out stumping and reporters writing about them. Uh, you know, until the, the near the end of the uh, 19th century, it was considered gauche and undignified for the presidential candidate to actually go out and make speeches and tour the country and, and meet plain folks. And um, the campaign media, such as it was, was almost all partisan newspapers, um, which were sort of, you know, beyond rogue before there was rogue. So, you know, you would call your, your the, the opponent, you know, a tool of the British crown or a moral reprobate, bigamist, swindler, whatever, and you would extol your man through whatever, you know, homey um, appellation he'd come up with, old rough and ready or old hickory. Um, and there really wasn't much in the way of, of campaign reporting. Um, modern campaign reporting, as we know it, really began um, early in this century, in the last century, how soon we forget. Um, and, um, you know, from about the time of Teddy Roosevelt to 1956, uh, candidates traveled by train around the country, and reporters covered with them, and every story they wrote had to have three things in it. They covered what the candidates said, the size of the crowd, and the weather. And that, that was about it. And, um, you know, these guys, there's a 1937 survey of 127 Washington correspondents. I found half of them had finished college, eight didn't have a high school diploma, two had never been to high school at all. Um, and, you know, these are guys who, who, you know, worked hard, had a good time. Um, you know, they drove around, they played poker, they drank with the candidates. It wasn't a bad deal. Um, but, um, you know, analysis or um, contest wasn't really what they're about. And um, it began to change somewhat in the 60s with the Kennedy administration. Um, but I think of three books that really have sort of traced the evolution of how we look at campaigns. The first was T.H. White's Making of the President, 1960. And, um, you know, it's hard to remember how unbelievably rudimentary campaign coverage was even then. I mean, basically, reporters didn't even really cover primaries. They were viewed as sort of these sort of low-level local events, and the candidates were going to be picked by the party bosses anyway. Um, so, um, you know, the coverage wasn't, you know, it was sort of a slightly more sophisticated version of the guys on the train. Um, and Teddy White basically decided that, you know what, there was more to the world than reporting what, what Al Smith said at the campaign stop in Topeka. And he decided that, in fact, when he looked at the campaign, the, the cast of characters, both, both in the front and in the rear, uh, the political machinations, the demographics of the country, the atmospherics of campaigning, that, you know, th there was this amazing Shakespearean drama going on, and it was being reported um, in these, you know, uh, staid, uh, simplistic, one day stories. And so the, the making of the president in 1960 came across as something re of a revelation that after the campaign was over, he wrote this very rich narrative, novelistic look at what had happened. And, you know, reporters aren't always brilliant, but people did read that book and think, hmm, maybe we can do that before the election's over. And that was the first thing that I think that in lots of ways changed the way reporters approached what they did. Uh, the second book was The Selling of the Presidents, which was about the, um, basically the, the advertising and media strategies to sell uh, Richard Nixon in 1968. Um, and, you know, that book began with the premise that in Oz, you have to look behind the curtain. And it basically, you know, sort of looked at the, at the campaign for the first time really through the lens of media strategy and, um, and management 
rather than just the candidate and his handlers. And the third book I think of is uh, The Boys on the Bus by Tim Krauss, which for the first time, it did two things. Um, one, sort of unbelievably, it made reporters something of heroes, or at least lovable characters. And two, pro probably even more importantly, it looked at them as not just observers of the process, but players in the process. And, um, you know, it's hard to think back to, again, how, how different things were um, uh, then. But um, when I was talking to um, one of the classes today, I mentioned that when I, my first job in journalism was at the Wilmington News Jour uh, Journal in Wilmington, Delaware. You walked into this newsroom, and it was this um, one you could barely see. There was so much smoke there. I think you had to smoke there. Um, and, you know, you, you get cancer in a year. Um, and everybody sat at these great, big, heavy, metal industrial desks, and there's this incredibly loud clatter of typewriters. And on every desk, there is a glue pot. Now, why would there be a glue pot on a newspaper person's desk? Someone will answer this question. No guesses? Exactly. Well, not for, not for pasting up the story. For basically, when that, back then, when you cut and paste, you cut and paste. And everyone had scissors, and you wrote your stories on these many, many um, pieces of carbon paper. And to give them to the copy desk, you glued them together. And um, if you didn't like a paragraph that you wrote and you couldn't read your edi editing scribble, you cut it out and you wrote a new version of it and you pasted it together. And um, that, that's really the era of the boys on the bus, um, which basically looked at the 20 or 30 reporters, all of them boys or men, who um, covered the 1972 McGovern campaign. And um, the amazing thing, or well, there are many amazing things about that book when you read it in, in retrospect. First is that the only thing that mattered was print, that they're the guys that set the agenda, these were the guys that, that decided what was news, what wasn't news, who was hot, who was not hot. There wasn't a whole lot of, of, of polling. So basically, they were really sort of the, the combined conventional wisdom of the American press. Uh, TV's job basically was to show up at, at campaign events um, and um, film what was going on. But um, it was basically reactive to the stories as defined by the guys on the bus. And of the people on the bus, there was a very strict pecking order. So Walter Mears of the Associated Press, after, after every day's speech, um, all the reporters would gather around and Walter Mears would type up his lead or, or just say, the lead is Cambodia or the lead is Social Security. And everybody else would, get, would scurry back to their typewriters and write pretty much the same, the same story. And the, the riskiest thing you could do would be to write a story different than everyone else was writing because that meant there was probably something wrong with you. I mean, if everybody said the story was X, and you said the story was Y, you know, chances are they're right and you're, you're not so right. Um, and um, you know, the second, well, well, even more important, was R.W. Apple of the New York Times, who was you know, universally known as the best source, best informed, most in touch political reporter in the United States. And, you know, if, if he said that McGovern was, had no chance of carrying the crucial state of Michigan or whatever, that was the wisdom. And it really came from, from one guy. Um, uh, they even considered themselves, they called themselves, um, back, at, back in, the, in that time, there was a radical group called Students for Democratic Society. And they, I assume jokingly, called themselves political writers for, for a democratic society. But their job was basically to set the agenda, and they did it. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it, in lots of that, that era now is as distant as the glue pot on my cancer-filled desk at the Wilmington News Journal. Um, so when I think of, of two races that I covered over the years that, that kind of defined a lot of what we see today, um, the first was uh, in 1988, I wrote a magazine story on the Dukakis-Bush campaign basically focusing on the race in Texas. Uh, Lloyd Benson, Texas senator, was on uh, Dukakis's, uh, his, his vice presidential uh, nominee. And this was at a time so distant that the Democrats actually had a chance of winning Texas, or were thought to have a chance of winning Texas. Um, 
And if you remember that race, Dukakis came out of the, the convention up by 17 points. Um, Reagan was not the, the sort of the icon he's viewed as today, but was viewed as sort of a, a guy with successes and failures as president. And he had the Iran-Contra disaster in his last months. And, um, you know, it looked like it was Dukakis's race to lose. And he came out of the convention uh, up 17 points. And in something the world really hadn't seen before, he was day by day demolished. You know, it was like the Republicans took an axe to him every day. And um, it's like the part in Monty Python, like where they cut off the arm, they cut off the leg, and they cut off the other leg. It was like that. And um, um, George Bush, the elders, media advisor was a guy named Lee Atwater, who was sort of rove before rove, um, who, who sort of most famously in a Senate race in South Carolina um, sort of casually uh, told reporters that their opponent had been hooked up to jumper cables, meaning he had, had electroshock therapy. And, um, you know, Atwater sort of just was a genius at um, negative campaigning. And um, it was like a race in which one side had a bazooka and the other side had a, had a um, slingshot. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, that race sort of set up two dynamics that are with us today. Um, the first is the adage that it's the culture stupid, it's not the economy. I mean, basically, um, Bush campaigned in flag factories, then he hit Dukakis for, um, uh, for uh, vetoing uh, uh, legislation that would have made it mandatory for all students to salute the flag. And, you know, all what we come to think of today as wedge issues, this was sort of the, the first golden age of the wedge issues. And, um, and the second thing that, the, that Atwater was brilliant at was knowing that a campaign didn't play out, wasn't something that played out over months and months. It was a game played every single day. And there was a story that the, that the um, Bush camp had every single day. And pretty much they defined the agenda. They, you know, destroyed Dukakis. Uh, and um, um, when I did the story, I, I, one of the guys I talked to was, was Bill Graham, famous this year as, as McCain's astute economic advisor. Um, and I remember, you know, he, was, he talked to me, and I'm not going to try to mimic his East Texas accent, but he basically said that um, there's only one thing you need to know about politics in the United States, and that's, um, you know, you, there's, there's no silver bullet, but you come up with one thing after another thing after another thing, and at some point, um, Joe turns to Sarah across the table and says, Honey, that Dukakis is not our kind of person. And basically, it was, it was a, 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 you know, the realization that there were very instinctive judgments that people made about candidates, and if you could make them congruent with all the all the sort of dictates of the culture on your side, you're going to win. Um, and it's funny, I, 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 I barely could read her Latin, but Maureen Dowd's column Sunday ended with Atwater and Dukakis kind of that. So, um, the, the, the next election I, I, I covered was, was uh, the 1992 uh, Clinton's first election. Um, and I'll never forget that uh, I was writing a magazine story um, basically on doing a profile of him during the middle of the campaign. And the first amazing thing about that story was that we would even think of doing it. I mean, a magazine story in the New York Times basically is set in type for about seven days. So you have to have a story that a week later will be able to hold up. And um, you know, even then, Basically, this was a story that you didn't know if in a week he was going to be the front runner or he was going to be out of the race, because there are all these um, allegations of womanizing and all the rumors out there. You never knew they're going to, what was going to happen with him. Um, but you know, two things strike me about that. One is is how unbelievably the pace of change, uh, the, the, uh, the pace of journalism has changed. That in 1992, which which so, for some of us in this room doesn't seem like ancient history. Um, you could actually do a story that would be dead, essentially, for seven days in the middle of a highly competitive campaign and think you could get away with it. Um, and the other one was uh, when, when the campaign was going on, Clinton and Carville and George Stephanopoulos would constantly be running into broom closets and into bathrooms to huddle over strategy. And, you know, it, it was clear in retrospect that this all had to do with rumors uh, the, uh, of an affair with a woman named Jennifer Flowers, which came out a little later. Um, but um, 
none of this was really reported. There were sort of little rumors, there were hints here or there, but um, the mainstream media, basically us, the New York Times and the others, dictate, dictated what was a story and what wasn't a story, and um, we said this wasn't a story. And even when the National Enquirer, as, as usual, um, broke the story a few weeks later, you know, we did very little on it until it was, uh, you know, on a, a television event, and then we had to follow it from there. So anyway, so so I think um, 88 basically set the rules. 1992 was the representation of the of the the pace of change back then, um, and. You know, I think where we are now, I think the, the best description I ever heard of how journalism works came from Richard Condon, the novelist, who's most famous for the Manchurian Candidate, this sort of very dark, conspiratorial look at American politics. And he compared American politics to this um, pageant on barges in the, along the Nile, along a bend of the Nile. So, you know, the first, the O.J. Simpson float comes around. The, the greatest float in the history of the world, the, you know, the, um, the, the, the crime of the century, coverage for weeks and weeks and weeks, what could top it? But in fact, it, co it comes and goes, and then comes along the Princess Di floats, um, the death of, you know, the, the, the Princess Di of, of Britain. And um, what could possibly top that? But it goes, and then, you know, the, the Bush Gore, um, uh, stalemate uh, in 2000, or, you know, 9-11, the worst float of, you know, the worst, scariest float of them all. But they come and go, and we always need something new. And, you know, with them, they're, they're little sort of ancillary floats, I mean, like the Natalie Holloway float. That was, a, you know, was a terrific little float. In fact, it, you know, whatever, for whatever it's worth, so many of the ancillary floats have to do with murders of women. So I don't know what to draw from that. Um, but um, that was really the way... Um, you know, I think our business operated until maybe four, five, six years ago. And now, instead of the bend, the pageant on the Nile, it's more like a constant game of Grand Theft Auto, where boom, 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 boom. You know, it's not, it's not a leisurely pageant. There's got to be a story, and there's got to be an even better story the next day. And I think that's the back, the, sort of the backdrop to, to where we are today. So, so just to throw out, you know, a, a bunch of thoughts and then try to pull them together at the end. Um, First, when people talk about the media today or media coverage, no one knows what the media are. Um, you know, is it the New York Times? Is it Fox News? Is it the National Enquirer? Is it Huffington Post? Is it Drudge? Is it, is it Daily Kos? Is it Talking Points Memo? Um, you know, it, we once knew when the guys were on the bus who the media were and what they were. We no longer know that. Um, um, uh, two, um, you know, for all the demonization of the media or the filter, um, absolutely no one's in control. As opposed to, you know, there's no Walter Mies, Mears sitting as, as, as typewriter and everybody looks at him and says, well, what's the lead, Walter? There's no Johnny Apple who says, this is the wisdom, all must follow. There is no avuncular figure that, draw, that we all can turn to as sort of a source of wisdom like Walter Cronkite, the CBS anchor for many years. Um, so, you know, if I'm going to ask you, well, gee, who have been the most influential journalists over the last year or two? In fact, anyway, any any thoughts, any answers? If I can ask any of you to shout out a name or two. Read Alter. Uh huh. Well, but the rest of the world doesn't. Yeah. But um, I mean, you know, Katie Couric, Tina Fey. Uh, you know, the National Enquirer beating the world on on John Edwards. Um, you know, the Huffington Post blogger who, you know, came up with the bitter gate story, um, Bill O'Reilly. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways, Bill O'Reilly is our Walter Cronkite. He's all, well, we'll get to that, but, but, but O'Reilly's bigger, right? Um, anyway, um, so in, in fact, David Carr, who's a great media writer for the Times, uh, at the uh, Democratic Convention, uh, had this quote from Rahm Emanuel, the Democratic representative from um, Illinois, who said, you know, there's still big fish, but you know, he said media coverage really has become more like a collective intuitive consciousness, he added. It will be like a school of fish. You won't hear anything, you'll just see the air bubbles, and then the whole group will suddenly decide to turn at the same time. And I think that's pretty good. That's about where we are. Um, three, uh, indisputably, print matters less. 
It's just, it's just where we are today. And this is a source of great consternation at many newspapers, including the New York Times. Um, I thought one of, the, one of the best newspaper stories I read in, this, in the election was about two weeks after Sarah Palin was picked as vice president, and the Times sent four or five people to Alaska and did this very powerful, I thought devastating story about her administrative record as um, mayor and as governor and who, who her appointments were and how she picked them and whatever. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing that almost no other organization could do. It took a lot of work, took a lot of reporting, and, you know, it vanished without a trace. It was a one-day story. Uh, it wasn't really picked up by, by television. It's not kind of a, the kind of story that you could actually make into a, the story of the day. Um, and you can argue, which I think is true, that all of the coverage um, affects the subconscious of the school of fish so that it registers on some level and affects the reporting, the subsequent reporting. But as a sort of a major reporting event, it came and it disappeared, um, almost without a trace. Uh, I think the fourth thing I'd say is that, you know, sort of there's almost no memory that stories, even when they're big stories, you know, it's again, in the ground, grand theft auto game, you know, the story comes, it's big or it's not big for a day or two, but we need something new to replace it. Um, fifth thing I'd say, and this is sort of my general rule of campaign coverage over the year, is the stupid story always trumps the real story. So, um, you know, the story that's going to really register, you know, something that people can chatter on all night long on CNN and MSNBC and Fox, um, has to be something that is very, very easy to understand. But Matt, Matt Taibbi, who's written great pieces for Rolling Stone, says, uh, everybody knows that if it takes more than five seconds to explain the story, it's not going to make a, lo a lot of noise on the campaign trail. Uh, and I think that's pretty true. And, you know, my favorite example of that, which I think um, was in the last election, if you remember, uh, um, uh, Kerry had won the first two debates, and it looked like he had won the third debate. And, you know, it, that, it, it seemed like that was going to be this big moment in terms of the media coverage of the, of the campaign from there on. Except, um, after it was over, you know, he had, he had, he had made this reference um, basically congratulating the Cheneys or saying, you know, expressing his, his support for how well they had, you know, uh, uh, you know support for their daughter who's a lesbian and which is not a, anything secret. The whole world knew it. And, it seemed like this little throwaway line in a long debate on many, many serious issues. And immediately after the debate was over, um, Lynn Cheney got up, and she had never been so insulted in all her life. And um, to, you know, that, and he mentioned that, of course, that, you know, these are bad people. These are bad, bad people. And Fox News and uh, talk radio could not stop talking about this. And for three days, this was the story. And um, it sort of wiped the rest of the debate off, off the table to the extent that, you know, the herd is affected by this stuff. I mean, it sort of stopped whatever momentum Kerry is going to be. And did that cost an election? Who knows? But it, it mattered. And it was, a, it was a big event. And it was, again, it was a case of the stupid story trumping everything else. Now, in this election, the stupid story par excellence was lipstick on a pig, which may be one of the all-time Hall of Fame stupid stories. Um, and, um, you know, when it came out, you know, one of these sort of somewhat nagging media watchdog groups, you know, said, you know, is there any story, if it's brought out by the candidates, that's so stupid that the media will not spend two or three days on it? And the answer is no. I mean, if it's a story that has enough, you know, uh, it's sort of uh, talk radio, cable chatter appeal, um, uh, they always have staying power. Um, so, so, I, so I would say the stupid story uh, trumps the you know, always trumps the real story. Um, and except number six, except when it doesn't. And the amazing thing about this year has been how much reality has in fact short-circuited the game. So, for instance, lipstick on a pig did work after you know, sort of in the silly season after the campaigns, uh, after the stock market crash, after everything that's gone on since, um, you know, it, 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 
it just doesn't. And it's one of the few elections, I think, in, in recent memory where, um, you know, the, the, the clear gravity of the issues facing the country have been so uh, momentous that it really has sort of pushed a lot of the stuff, the, the ancillary stuff, off the table. Um, you know, much to the chagrin of the McCain campaign, because, um, you know, in lots of ways they're trying to, to play by the same rules, you know, which have worked, you know, for the last um, 20 years or so. Um, and at least for now, who knows what will happen, um, they're, not working now, they're not working now. Say the seventh thing I'd say about the campaign co coverage is the single biggest dilemma, and something we haven't figured out and maybe we can't, is <coughs> avoiding the equivalency trap. That our job is really not to make judgments, it's just to report what the two sides say. So, if one side's ads, let's say, are demonstrably false, you have to write a story in which you say, well, these guys' ads are demonstrably false, but this guy's ads aren't so great either. Um, and <coughs> excuse me. that's our default position in campaign coverage. And I think it's interesting the degree to which there's been, um, you know, some, some pushback against that. And um, pushback from the press, you know, in general. I mean, I think, again, to whatever the heck we are, um, I think we've sort of grown a backbone this year. So um, if you remember, after Sarah Palin was picked, <coughs> and at the height of the, the boomlet for her, um, McC McCain campaign said that, well, she's not going to do any, any interviews until she's treated with respect and deference. You know, as, this, as, this, as, as if this was like the rollout of J-Lo's next movie, where... <coughs> You know, if you don't play the rules, you don't get to talk fire to her. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think that, that didn't work. And I think, as with the equivalence, equivalency issue, um, partly, and I'll get this later, because of the influence of the blogs, uh, I think we're a little less of a captive of that. So, for instance, um, on the ABC website today, <coughs> um, a story by Jake Tapper, who's a very good reporter, the headline is, of it is Palin Troopergate. Uh, Palin makes Troopergate assertions that are flatly false. Now, we didn't really used to do that. Um, and even if they were false, you know, you'd say, well, some people say they're false. The campaign says they're not false. And so it split the difference. Um, so I think because of lots of reasons, there is a lot more pushback and a, more, a lot more willingness to make judgments in this cycle than there have been in the past. Um, nice thing I'd say. Um, um, the one, the, the thing, and everyone, everyone at the Times, I think anyone who really looks at the, the election this year, I mean, I think a lot of the coverage has been really good. But the thing that that you can be fairly critical for everybody on is that the issue coverage has gotten lost. That there's so much, uh, you know, drama and so much atmospherics and so much on this first and that first that um, really covering, you know, it, you know, drilling down on the issues is something that has not been done very well. And Clark Hoyt, who is our terrific ombudsman, you know, had a column on this um, Sunday in which he noted that through, through Friday, 270 news articles published in the Times about the election since the national tickets were formed in, in, in late August, only 29 or a little over 10 percent were primary, primarily about policy substance. And, you know, this is the year, allegedly, when people, re that's exactly what people want. Um, and I think anybody, and pe you know, and people at the Times would agree to this, that it, it, there's, it's just been overwhelmed by the, by the drama and atmospherics of what's gone on. Um, um, I, 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 although the caveat I give to that is, you know, on the one hand, People always say this is what they want. Is it really what they want? I mean, the Times can, and I'm sure will, drop 4,000-word stories comparing, comparing both candidates' health care plans. Now, will people really read that? Will te television pick up on that? Is that the story of the day? Is that what moves people? Maybe not. So. Hence, I'd say, uh, the, the, the other extraordinary thing about this election, which, which, which was true to a certain extent in 2004, but not nearly this, to this extent, is that we're almost back to the colonial era 
in terms of having an, a blatantly partisan media, or at least a lot of the media that's blatantly partisan. So if you're conservative, you can watch Bill O'Reilly every night. If you're liberal, you can watch Keith Olbermann every night. If you want to get your news with a conservative slant, you can go online and read Matt Drudge. If you want a liberal slant, you could read Daily Kos. Um, and, you know, I think the good and bad elements to this, the, the bad or worrisome one, is whether we reach the point that people only go to the news that tells them what they want to hear. Um, and, you know, I think there's some of that going on. Um, the eleventh thing I'd say is, without doubt, this is the year that the web has completely come, uh, become not just a full partner, but almost an essential part of the campaign coverage. So one of my friends who's one of the political editors at the Times says that the thing that she's proudest of is what the Times does on the web. And that, um, you know, she basically thinks that as good as the news coverage is in the paper, that to understand the election, you absolutely have to see what's on the web, the, you know, um, you know during, the, during the debates, if a candidate make, makes an assertion, you can immediately see what the candidate has said before, get a fact check of it. I mean, something completely extraordinary that has not happened before and is absolutely uh, crucial to um, uh, how the coverage has been. Twelfth uh, thing I've said is that we figured race out a lot better than gender, which I think is a big surprise. I mean, I think when the, when the year began, um, I think people would have thought that, that race would have been the real explosive kind of third rail of the campaign. And in some ways, maybe it, maybe that that explains uh, what we did, that that racial topics are very tough to deal with, and we deal with them, tread on them very, very lightly. Gender, you know, I mean, and whether or not Hillary Clinton uh, was treated unfairly by the press, you, know, you can argue it either way. But, um, for instance, there was the episode um, earlier in the year when, um, uh, during the primaries, when some voter came up to John McCain and said, you know, how are you going to deal with the bitch? Or what's your plan to deal with the bitch? Now, translate whatever slur you want for race, and that's, you know, not just a huge story, but completely beyond the pale. Um, you know, with gender, they're able to do it. Or, or when when the um, Hillary would go to the, ra the rallies and people, would, you know, the protesters would have the Iron, iron My Shirt um, signs. Um, same thing. I mean, in terms of race, I mean, clearly that in, in – in, um, all sorts of ways that are on the surface and below the surface is out there, and who knows how much it will be out there more over the next few weeks, but not as blatantly as you could deal with gender and get away with it. Um, Thirteenth, I say that um, uh, this year um, the blogs have, have absolutely become an absolutely central part of the political campaign in a way they never were before. Uh, the last time was the first time they were sort of beginning to be players. But, um, you know, this woman I mentioned who's one of the editors, uh, political editors at uh, Times, says she reads every day 600 blog posts on 20 sites. And those are sort of the semi-official New York Times, uh, Atlantic, um, ABC News, those kind of sites. It doesn't include Daily Kos or Huffington Post or all those. Um, and at the convention, in for the Democratic convention, Politico.com uh, had 40 people there. Huffington Post had 20. Talking po Points Memo had nine. Daily Coast had 10. Slate had seven. Salon had nine. Um, they're 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 you know equal partners in the process this time, and I think almost entirely to the good. Um, I think they've um, you know been great uh, in, in terms of fact checking the, the mainstream media. I think they've prodded us to do things. Uh, we wouldn't do before. I think they've made us be sharper and more pointed. Um, I think in almost every way, um, you know, some of them are good, some of them are ludicrous, but collectively, um, they played a huge role in it. Uh, 14th, I would say, um, thinking back on the boys on the bus, um, um, you know, in some ways, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a really fun book to read, and it, it really glamorized campaign reporting in a way. You know, you basically you stayed up late, you know, with your friends. You went out drinking with your friends. You traveled around the country. It was kind of like being in college. Um, and, um, um, you know, and there's, there's definitely some of that quality on the campaign trail. But I have to say, being a campaign reporter now is so 
exhausting. You know, in, in the old days, basically, you'd write your story, and the next morning, your editor might say, hey, the Washington Post had this, why didn't you have this? Now, you'll write your blog post, or you'll write whatever, and, you know, the, this editor who's, who's reading uh, 600 blog posts on 20 sites says, gee, why didn't you have what Daily Post has? Why didn't you have this? Um, there's, it's not the 24-hour news cycle. It's the, it's the minute-by-minute news cycle. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. What, I don't know exactly how people keep that up, especially over you know a, a two-year election like this. But um, it's just an exhausting job. Um, Fifteenth, I would say, um, the thing I most worry about in terms of the future of campaign coverage is who's going to do the reporting. Um, and you know, the, the, um, the Times was able to send their four or five people to Alaska to to look at Palin's record. Um, I think so much in the news media, news environment now, um, basically rewards bloviators. That's how you become a, a star, become a talking head on television. Um, and the hard work of reporting is incredibly expensive. It often makes not a drop in the collective consciousness like that um, story of the Times did from Alaska. And as, as the budgets of media organizations sink, you wonder who in the future is going to do really the most important, the primary, the essential work of, of reporting out the stories. So what does this all come to? Um, uh, I come up with a few things. Um, first, it's the voters stupid in the sense that, you know, you always hear people complaining about, oh, the media does a terrible job, or I don't have enough information, or I can't make up my mind. Like, like right about now when they have debates and they, they get these undecided voters who aren't really undecided voters, they're just people who want to be on television. Um, and, um, you know, they often, you often hear, oh, I'm not hearing the candidates say this or that. And some of it's a little valid. But basically, there has never been a time in the history of the world where anybody with an Internet connection could find out more information in more depth, with more nuance from more points of view than there is now. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, if people are, if people are uninformed, you know, they've made a judgment to be uninformed. And, you know, we're, we're always tough on, we're cut tough on the candidates, we're tough on the news media, as we certainly should be on both. But, you know, on some level, you know, people run out of excuses when they say, well, gee, we don't have the information we need to make a decision. It's not true. Um, two, uh, you know, in terms of, of how extraordinary this year is, I mean, you can say it is true. This is the, the first election in a half century in which there's not an incumbent president or vice president running. That makes it extraordinary. Um, you had the first serious black candidate. You had the first uh, serious woman candidate, um, you know, in reach of, the, of getting a presidential nomination. So in lots of ways, indisputably, it is, it is a year uh, like no other in some ways. But, you know, is this, does that mean that the elections in the future will, will, will be um, demonstrably different in terms of the way the press coverage is? And I, I think no, because in, in, in the sense, to some ways, you know, the medium or the media are the message in the sense that there's so much out there, so much of a hunger for news, so much of a demand for, again, in the Grand Theft Auto, you know, you've got to have a new shot, you have to have a new story, you have to have a new storyline. Um, I don't think that's going to change, and I think in lots of ways, um, this election, rather than an event that will look, be looked upon as a once-in-a-lifetime election, it's more like the new normal. This is the way the game, in lots of ways, is going to be played. Um, three, I'd say, um, you know, and again, I, I mean, I don't cover elections regularly. I have no dog in this fight. Um, there's some things we do well and some, some things we don't do well. But, you know, I think in lots of ways, for all the, all the failings, and there are many of the, of the media, well, you know, this is sort of like a golden age in lots of ways of, of campaign coverage because you still have um, the big newspapers like the Times, the Post, the LA Times, with the resources to really go out and report stories in all the depth they need. Um, will that be the, the case in four years, eight years, 12 years? Uh, that's not at all certain. Um, you have this clamor of opinion and reporting on cable. Um, you have all these voices on the web and on blogs and on YouTube and wherever you want to get your news, whether it's um, 
you know, the Daily Show or National Enquirer. Um, um, and, and I think in terms of, of, of the, the information that's been disseminated, the hard part is just fighting your way through this incredible blizzard of information and news and opinion and voice. So, um, um, the, you know, the Pew Foundation recently had a report in which they said, well, gee, back in February, 55% uh, of the people said the news coverage was good or excellent. Now, 54 say that it's fair or poor. But I don't, you know, I don't think that's so much a reflection on that we're doing so much worse. I think, I think people are just overwhelmed. And for that one, I just don't think there's any answer. Um, and I do think there's, there's a fair coverage that there should be more issue reporting. There has to be, um, um, there probably will be in the next few weeks. But in fact, whether that's what people really, really want, whether people are going to read our 5,000 word stories on, on health care, whether cable news has any way to make sense of things like that, uh, uh, who knows. Um, and then you know, a final thought, and this is just uh, supposition, but we've gone from, whatever, six television channels to 600. We've gone from 10 famous pundits to any dope with a, with a, with a modem can be a famous pundit. Um, we've gone from 30 boys on the bus to a whole universe of, of journalists, citizen journalists, anti-journalists, proto-journalists, neo-journalists, we're all journalists on this bus. Um, so in this whole, you know, multiplicity of voices and options, with everything expanding, do we have two parties forever? We have more of everything else, but we're going to have the same two parties? So I don't, I don't know that it's inevitable, but, um, you know, I certainly think that one logical extension of the multiplicity of voices in the media at some point are more options for candidates, in terms of candidates. And this is certainly not, not just a function of the media environment, but I think it's part of it. Um, and again, um, you just look at this year. Um, I mean, here you had um, Mayor Bloomberg of New York um, flirting and thinking very seriously about running for president. Um, uh, you know, what are the chances of a Jewish mayor of New York being elected president? Who knows? But if you have a guy who actually knows a heck of a lot about finance at this moment in history, um, uh, you know, I think certainly had he been running, it's, he would be a very credible candidate and, and I think could have won. And in the future, there are just many more ways for people to get their story out, to create a boomlet on the web, to become viable in the way they couldn't before. And so I don't know if we have, uh, if this means the cracks in the two-party system, but it certainly would facilitate them. So anyway, that's me. Um, uh, any thoughts, questions, complaints about the New York Times? It's always, always a popular item. Our, our editor, Bill K Keller, has uh, every quarter or so has a session where um, he meets with the staff, and it's called throw, throw Things at Bill, which is kind of endearing at him. So if you want to throw things at or to me, I'm glad to listen. I'm not convinced that we're seeing Approaching this very narrow from the standpoint of the very narrow <coughs> right and left mm -hmm. approaches to this. But in fact, there are some serious viewpoints and views out there that in fact see what's going on with our financial system as a you know, harbinger of massive problems with the fundamentals of the system itself. Mm -hmm. them really seriously raising these alternatives instead focused as always on the narrow democratic republican mm -hmm. wall street and we saw the first other website yeah. in this debate. Yeah. I don't think I think that's optimistic that's right. Yeah that's that, that's a fair point but when was it ever when was it ever better? It wasn't okay. But it's supposed to be better now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you, when you lean towards the idea that maybe this will even move the 
Uh-huh. Well, again, I don't, it, I'm not predicting it, but um, I, it certainly seems possible to me. And again, um, at least, at least they're, they're, you know, you know, anyone can, can be his own publisher. Anyone can start his own movement and reach, reach critical mass. And so it seems to me, just because it didn't reach full flower this year doesn't mean that it can't happen or that it's not a doubt. But, but, but uh, your point taken is there, and I guess. Absolutely true and absolutely fair. And in fact, you know, I, I, I should have mentioned that in a sense that, but I think it comes back to the responsibility on the voters um, and, and citizens that, you know, if, if ever there was truth in the idea of caveat emptor, it's in the media environment today. And, um, you know, shame on you if you, if someone emails you and says Obama's a, a Muslim, you say, oh, I didn't know that. You know, and, and, but you're right. I mean, there obviously is a lot of that out there. Um, you know, I mean, there's sort of, there have been scurrilous rumors and that sort of thing in other elections. But I agree that that is, that is the downside of this environment. That is definitely easier to go, as we say, viral on that kind of thing now and spread them further and quicker and more maliciously. And, um, you know, if, if, if I tell, talk about the upside of this, I mean, I think, you know, sort of the fury at some of these Republican rallies now, I think, is fed by the degree to which stuff that's toxic can get out there in a big way. So, yes? Um, we're teaching a course on media and politics. Bruce Barry and I are this semester. One of our speakers was um, Ann McDaniel from the Washington Post. And she was telling the story when she worked in a news booth. Okay. Uh, I was watching, she was telling the story when she was editing a Newsweek and Michael S. Carl King uh, got the story. It was a year before the story broke. The Monica Lewinsky story. And she says, well, the, the first thing I said to him after she said, well, why is this relevant? Why is this important? Now, okay, that's a, a good impulse. A good point of impulse to ask that question. She said, there's a lot of Stories. Um, you know, the Times reported that out. But there, so I think there's a low, fairly low bar to reporting. There is a high bar to print, to publishing. So in that case, or in, in you know John Edwards or some of this, I think you know almost you know prophylactically, if this is out there, and there's a chance it's kind of going to become a, you got to get up to speed on it. But it doesn't mean you need to publish it. And that's where sort of the real, some of the hard calls come in, and where. Um, and again, you know, on, 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 you know, the point about, you know, a lot of the stuff that gets out there, you know, uh, there's, there's just no, one, there's no going back to the days. I mean, I think the New York Times was a pretty good gate, gatekeeper, and you can make the uh, make the argument, which many people wouldn't, but that there's something to be said for having sort of a responsible grown-up who says this comes in the door, this doesn't. But those days are over, and they ain't coming back. So, yes. My question is, uh, <coughs> I've never seen anything any place else. Are there just some 
stories go nowhere? That go nowhere? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there, I mean, there, I mean, there are stories that you write that are worthy that land with a thud, um, and um, and and there there are lots of stories that that almost no one has the resources to do. So I'm sure. I mean, I remember that story somewhat, and you know, it took a lot of time for that oh, yeah. person to re report that out. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, I mean, my biggest worry I mean, in, in is. Um, as the economics become tougher and tougher and tougher for the traditional media. And that's why, again, I, I, when I say this is sort of the golden age, it ain't a perfect age. But in some ways, you still do have the mainstream media, um, you know, as I would say the New York Times is, is, is better than it's ever been. Um, you know, whether um, four, eight, 12 years of shrinking revenues allows you to keep up with that uh, is, a, is a real question. So, um, whether our coverage will be as good in four years or eight years or 12 years, we shall see. Yes? Uh -huh. Well, I think a lot of people, whatever role you want to say about the journalists, I mean, I, I, I think that's one thing that a lot of people wish were different. That, in fact, that the debates were debates instead of these opportunities to offer up talking points. So, um, you know, I think, I, but I think the fault is sort of less with, I mean, you could say, could Tom Brokaw have done X or could Gwen Eiffel have done Y? And maybe you can criticize it, but I think the problem is more the format as agreed on by the parties in the Presidential Debate Commission than on the performance of the journalists that are moderating, moderating them. I mean, I think in the primaries, the debates played a wonderful role um, and again, in terms of people who are saying, oh, gee, I can't hear what, I mean, how many people sat through those, you know, thousands of endless democratic debates? Not too many. Um, so it's out there if you want. Yes? I have a question about YouTube, which I don't think you really want. It's uh -huh. a question that we could be having a whole different conversation about the extent of our laws in particular had, you know, those guys not sat around to figure out how to do that video on YouTube the way they did. Mm -hmm.
to be honest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking a couple of years to get back to the speech of Detroit and New York. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a much more, they are certainly living in the last decade, so they're doing much more explosive issues with our respects in the neighborhood. Uh, I think I think informally, yeah, I mean, I say I I I do not work in years. I do I work in a little bit of my side. Like over many years, um, you know, I should have seen sort of different different kinds of issues. I think the story of the Mystic New York Times, where I would, you know, people might, might say, well, they're sensitive to, you know, issues of migrant women, and first to class, you know, first to women. And it's a subject that people are quite sensitive to. Um, I don't know if any places are sensitive to, you know, I'm not saying that they always get it right. 